All right, so today, hopefully, let me see what happens here. Wait, slideshow. Find the screen. <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully this works. We're going to try a couple new things today. This being one. And that work. Let's see. Oh, it worked all in practice and now it's not going to work. I cannot believe it. Slideshow. <clears throat> Okay, Marsha. <clears throat> Are you there? <clears throat> yes, I am. All right, can I ask you to lead the pledge of the allegiance? This is not working. Yes, you may. I'd be happy to. And Thank you. And we'll put your hand over your heart. And I pledge allegiance to the flag. Of the United States of America, of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So the inspiration for the day isn't going to work either. I don't know what happened here, but. All I have is the red dot. So would anyone like to give a prayer or the uh, inspiration for the date? I have one of these. I, I can, um, if you want me to say something out of the book, I can. Sure, please. Go ahead. Okay. Well, this is one I just opened up to, okay? Our father, you have granted to each of us a marvelous gift, creation. Now help us to do more than exist, but to live more than touch, but to feel more than look, but to observe more than read, but to absorb more than hear, but to listen more than listen, but to understand more than think than to ponder. More than plan, but to act. More than talk, but to say something. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia, for stepping up. Um, are there any guests today aside from Doug Smith? Aside from the speakers, of course, and, Doug's, and Doug Smith is a guest, correct? Um, I'm, yes, I'm a guest, and I, I need to introduce myself. I'm Kurt's brother. And as, as Janie and many of you know, I'm also a reporter for the LA Times, uh, uh, but my uh, presence today is a curiosity only. So from my point of view, this is not on the record. <laughs> All right, are there any other guests I'm missing? Okay, good. So the announcements for today, first of all, the club survey has been sent out to all of you. Uh, we have gotten 21 responses. This is not a right or wrong questionnaire. It's not a true or false questionnaire. Basically, we're just trying to get a reading on where the club is at today, how you feel about your club, what you'd like to see changed, if anything. So I really encourage all of you to please fill out this uh, club survey and get it back to us as quickly as possible. Thank you. Uh, pageant of the Arts, I think, uh, Phil, you're on. Are volunteers still needed? Yes, um, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge this year, but it looks like I've, I've asked everyone to give me a video of each performance, either whether it's speech, music, um, or in an art. In art, they're going to send pictures. So I'm thinking we might. I don't know if we can. I don't. I don't know if we have the the width on our website to post the videos of all the contestants. And that way everyone can kind of step in and, and view them and vote which one they like the best. Um, so if we don't have the room on the website for that, um, I'm trying to come up with a, an email that, that they can send all the videos to 
and then maybe we can have a way that people can link into those videos. This is this is a work in progress. This is this, it's kind of a mess, but um, we have people who are going to be a, are going to be performing um, in all the categories. It's just a matter of trying to coordinate um, how we get to view it all. So I mean, technically, I do need volunteers, but we might I might be able to open it up to everybody since 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 since, since we're not going to the school itself. Um, because then I'll open it up to everyone. Then we, if everyone who wants to log on to view the performances can give their opinion and then we can, we, we can tabulate it from there. So like I said, it's a work in progress. Um, I gotta talk to Nancy about which website that they or which email they to send the, the videos to. And I have to talk to Ed about the, um, or Ron about the, uh, putting them on our website. Um, so everyone can view it. I don't know. I don't know if we have enough width on our website for that. So okay. Well, let's have that conversation then off of this, um, and because we need to move along, I want to say that um, <clears throat> past president Ed Gall did offer up a song today, but we have a lot to cover before the speakers come on. So unfortunately, I'm postponing his song until next week. <clears throat> no problem. Uh, no problem. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Can't. Camp Pendleton donations will be collected March 13th and 14th. Please stay tuned to what is needed and where the drop-offs will be. <clears throat> uh, we were on the <clears throat> happy hour call with Santa Monica on Tuesday night, which was a lot of fun. There was a good turnout, maybe about 40 people, 45 people, <clears throat> at least for the first half hour <laughs> until they started the drinking games. <laughs> But anyway, they have a new member who does beach cleanup every other Saturday in Venice Beach. And he has invited us to join. If you're interested, the information is on the Santa Monica Rotary website. Uh, go ahead and go on up. And they meet at 9 a.m. on the Venice Boardwalk and uh, clean up the, uh, the beach. Okay, any other announcements? Okay, good. Uh, let me now present our past president, Stephen Day, who has some um, Paul Harris fellows to honor today. Thank, Steve? Thank you. Uh, thank you, past president, Diane. Appreciate that. Um, as your foundation chair, I, I come to you today to make some presentations of multiple Paul Harris fellow pins. Um, I've sent by mail to all the recipients, their uh, Paul Harris pins. Uh, hopefully you've all received them. And you see the listing here of those who um, are being honored today. And as we all know, uh, we have long recognized Rotarians who contribute a thousand dollars by recon recognizing them as Paul Harris fellows in honor of our founder. Um, we have well over a million Paul Harris fellows worldwide. Uh, but becoming a Paul Harris Fellow is not a miles is a milestone, not a destination. We ask those who become Paul Harris, Paul Harris Fellows to continue supporting the Rotary Foundation, and we recognize them as Paul uh, multiple Paul Harris Fellows every time they have contributed an additional thousand dollars to the foundation. With each additional thousand mm -hmm. dollars, we present to them a pin with a stone, either a sapphire or ruby, indicating their level of of contributions, total level of contributions. Uh, today, we have the privilege of recognizing 10 of our members uh, for their wonderful support of the foundation. Uh, you see listed here, those 10 honorees. Um, Mike Newman is getting his Paul Harris plus seven pin, which is two rubies. Ed Jackson, four sapphires. Peter Moore, three sapphires. Margie Downey, and uh, I, um, I sent a letter to Margie and also Pat Anderson um, and letting them know about their, this presentation um, and just saying hi. Um, as well as we have a Paul Harris Fellow plus two for Dwight and Phil Gabriel gets his one. Nancy gets a two by the way, wish she was here today, but um, um, we'll maybe make a quick note next week. And then Jim Meyer and John O'Keefe each also get their Paul Harris plus one. So, um, you know, I really think it's great that we continue to support Rotary Foundation, our gifts 
demonstrate our commitment to the common goals of world understanding and peace. So therefore, on behalf of the president of Rotary International and the chairman and trustees of the foundation, it gives me great pleasure to present to each of you, which again, you should have all received in the mail, your Paul Harris, lay, uh, multiple Paul Harris fellow pin in appreciation of your generous contributions to the annual program fund of our foundation. And again, thank you very much. <clears throat> And congratulations to all 10 of you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Diane. All right, we're going to continue the celebration because here are the March birthdays, anniversaries, and rotary anniversaries. <clears throat> and as you can see, uh, the men's ages are there, the women's are not. And anyone on this list that wants to donate the money for the number of years showing uh, to the foundation, that would be very acceptable. Otherwise, Terry, you know what the fine amount is, correct? Y yes, uh, it's $25. And I'll give you one correction. I couldn't check others quickly enough, but my dad is actually 95 today. Oh. Well, please wish him a happy birthday for all of us. Tell him we miss him. Yeah. All right, so moving right along here. Next week, Francis Gary Powers will be speaking about the uh, U2, U2 incident and uh, the controversial Cold War legacy. Tom uh, Barron will be introducing these two in just a minute. And I wanna thank you all for being here today. Tom? Okay. Ready to go. Uh, and it's my pleasure today to introduce today's speakers, Till Von Wachter and Janie Roundtree. Both are connected with the California Policy Lab at UCLA. Till is an economics professor here at UCLA and is the faculty director of the Policy Lab. He is also the Associate Dean of Research for the Division of Social Sciences at UCLA. Now he, you may remember, he has spoken previously to the club on unemployment and related labor issues, specifically the CARES Act. But when I spoke with him, he mentioned the studies involving homelessness in Southern California. Knowing this is a hot issue with most of us, I invite him back to speak on the topic. Well, Till zeroed in on the policy lab expert on homelessness, Jeannie Roundtree. Now I want you to listen carefully to the, her background. She is the founding executive director of the Policy Lab, and in, in addition, a member of the National Alliance to End Homelessness Research Council and deputy director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Now, here's the interesting part. Prior to joining the CPL, Janie was the mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel's Deputy Chief of Staff for Public Safety in Chicago <laughs> and responsible for developing and implementing the long-term strategic plan for evidence-based public safety policy, police reform, and violence preve prevention in Chicago. Prior to her duties in Chicago, she worked for Mayor Michael Bloomberg in New York as the Firearms Policy Coordinator Wow, talk about tough jobs. Janie, the policy lab must be a piece of cake for you. She has practiced law, Duke Law School, taught high school, and worked in the nonprofit sectors. So today we have a tag team presentation on this very important but growing issue that affects all of us, the homeless population. So you don't want to hear from me anymore. So Jill, Till, and Janie, you are up now. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction, Tom, and thank you everyone for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. We're going to tag team. I'm going to kick us off with a brief background on the California Policy Lab. And since I've been here before, I'll, I'll just keep it short to get you straight into homelessness, where Jamie is going to give an overview of our research. And um, you know, I think homelessness is a, in LA must rival you know working on gun violence in New York City. Um, <laughs> 
or I think we're making uh, some very important contributions and, and Janie will talk about that. Uh, Janie, I um, think you could start sharing the screen. Yeah, Till, just before you begin, I just need um, to enable screen share. Okay, give me a second here. Um, I'm gonna make you the host. And now you should be able to. <clears throat> okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great. Great, thank you. So I'm a professor of labor economics, uh, as Tom mentioned, and I've done a lot of work that has been very applied on unemployment insurance or disability insurance. And over you know, 20 years worth of research, my experience has been that our research could have a, a big effect on policy and how effectively funds are spent, um, but effectively it, 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 it seldomly does. Um, if you actually go to the Mark Zuckerberg slide, Janie. And if, if our impression has been that there's a lot of evidence out there and a lot of evidence needed, but most spending in California or at the federal level um, is not really driven uh, by evidence, especially on social programs. And so together with a set of colleagues and uh, with Janie, we a few years ago opened the California Policy Lab, which is a research institute at UCLA and we have a site at Berkeley um, that tries to do things a little differently to actually make a difference in how government funds are spent and how we are able to move the needle on the ground. And Jane, if you go back uh, to that slide, exactly. Um, so the California Policy Lab is somewhat unusual as a research institute in that our mission is to improve lives of Californians by working uh, with government agencies to generate evidence that really transforms public policies. And to do that, we realized we need to engage in longer run partnerships with the key agencies working in the social services space in California to really understand what they're doing, their data and where we can come in and help with you know, the high quality academic research that we do. And we settled on five program areas that roughly span the social policy space in California that's labor and employment, uh, homelessness, social safety net and criminal justice and education. And we're increasingly doing also work on health. And you know, the last time I, I spoke about the research we do on unemployment uh, that's happening in the labor and employment unit of the lab. And today you'll hear about the homelessness and high needs work we do in LA in particular. And this mission we have really impacts on how we do things. And I think we have built up a very powerful organization to you know, be able to work in tandem with government, which is um, not, not your traditional academic work. Jane, if you skip ahead a couple of slides. So he, here's what we do. Uh, we approach government partners and increasingly we are approached by government partners. And once we deem an area of being of sufficient importance, right? Uh, for example, homelessness is clearly such an area. We seek out the various actors in that field. And Janie will talk more about that, who that is in LA. And we sit down to you know, really think what evidence is needed and where can we add value with the available data. And often it takes quite a while to actually obtain and link and clean the data that we need to answer the questions that are needed. That's particularly true in the homelessness sphere. And so we have a very secure data lab and spend a lot of time at UCLA, you know, cleaning often very confidential data. And when, once that's done, we can use that data for a stream of research um, that spans from, you know, the, the, the basic evidence that government agencies need to do their day-to-day -day decisions up to very rigorous academic research on the functioning and effect of, of government programs. And then the a key difference with respect to sort of the typical academic approach is that 
when a study is done, it's, we just we don't just send off a PDF to our partners. We really work with them and make sure that these findings can get implemented. Um, and also, we we try to, you know, harness the data infrastructure that exists so that it doesn't you know disappear again, and it will be available for other research, either by us or by others. And so the, the homelessness area is, is really a great example of everything that the California Policy Lab does because it's an area that is, is, is so in need of urgent and high impactful research and at the same time um, has such difficulties in the data sphere. So we could really, you know, come in and work with partners on the ground to measure the incidents and effects of homelessness. And at the same time, think through uh, sort of some key junctures where our evidence buildings can help move the needle on the ground. And the lab in particular has made uh, an investment into homelessness prevention. And the idea here is that homelessness itself is such a detrimental event for the individuals or families experiencing it. And relatively quickly, once individuals are homeless, lead to pretty expensive interventions that you know taxpayers are funding to get these folks back on their feet. And the hope is that by relatively cheap intervention, homeless has, can be prevented. Now, of course, finding the individuals who are at risk of homelessness among the, you know, unfortunately million of low income individuals in the county is very hard. And so we have spent some time trying to predict first time homelessness, and then we have evaluate, you know, existing homeless prevention programs. But prevention is not the only thing we do. It's, it's, it's sort of the signature of the lab because so few others have worked on that. But, you know, once we had the capacity and our understanding of the data, we quickly became involved in, in many other important projects. And one is, has been uh, on the racial disparities in homelessness service outcomes. Um, another one is we have assessed the uh, employment capacity of, of homelessness individuals, partly to understand, you know, what, it, what is the scope of getting these individuals back into society as functioning and also earning members. We are in the process of evaluating the main triage tool that the county uses to assign homelessness services which really had no strong, or I don't, I don't think any evidence base so far. And we, we have uh, a, a study on uh, the, the intersection of serious mental illness, incarceration and homelessness. And th this research um, is, is written up in either reports, right? Or policy briefs that we get out because you know we really focus on uh, getting high quality findings out to our partners so that they can start, you know, evaluating the things they do and start moving the needle. And uh, you know, with that as a, as a very bird's eye overview, I'm gonna pass it on to Janie, who's gonna you know, zoom in on the homelessness problem in LA. Hey, can you all hear me okay? Um, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me until here today to talk about this issue. Um, I just wanna say I'm Totally happy to, to be interrupted at any time if people have um, questions or you want me to pause on a, on a particular concept. So um, please just chime in. Um, and, and Doug, it's always nice to see you. <laughs> it's nice to see you in, in this particular context today. Um, so I'm gonna spend most of my time today talking about prevention and how we understand who's at risk of homelessness in Los Angeles. But I find it useful to just start with some quick facts about the homeless um, population and the scope of the problem here in Los Angeles before we get into the details. Um, I find that many people, most people that I interact with in LA have very basic questions about homelessness and, and what the causes are. So you may be familiar every year, they release data from what's called the point in time count. There's actually thousands of volunteers that go out into the community once a year and count homeless individuals and that is not occurring this year due to the pandemic, but it typically happens in January. And the last time we had an estimate in 2020, they observed about 66,000 people who were homeless um, during that night. I think it's worth pointing out that 
of course, not every homeless person is homeless every night. We think there are about at least 140,000 unique individuals who experience homelessness in any given year. So um, it's, it's a lot of people um, and it's, I think the largest homeless population in the country. People will sometimes ask, you know, are they really from here or are they showing up in Los Angeles to take advantage of services or lax enforcement or the nice weather? When those people are surveyed during the point in time count, minimum 82% report being from, uh, from recently in California. Um, we have further evidence of that because we linked the people, the data on people getting homeless services in Los Angeles to California wage records. And we saw that 75% of people getting services have an employment history in California. So I think the point here is that these are really our community members. People don't travel long distances um, when they're homeless. They typically don't have the resources to do that. Just to focus um, a little bit more on this employment data that Till mentioned, we also saw when we linked wage records that close to 40% of people entering the homeless services system were working in California within two years of becoming homeless. So it's not the case that every homeless person is so severely capacitated by mental health issues or substance use disorder that they're not working. Um, there's a huge portion of, of people who are working and including people who are working throughout their homelessness. The flip side of that coin though, is that their average wages were just under $10,000 a year. It's really unfathomable that uh, to live in Los Angeles with our cost of living here and be earning just under $10,000 a year. We also um, get a lot of questions about mental illness, the connection between homelessness and, and serious mental illness. And I think it's worth understanding that um, when we look at people entering services for the first time, we have no prior record of seeing them in any services. When we look at that group of people each year, about 10% of them have some record of receiving public mental health services. That percentage goes up quite a bit when you include the chronically homeless population or people who have been served before. So we don't really know the answer to this question, but it appears that there's some group of people who are potentially becoming homeless due to their serious mental illness, but it's not the majority of people. And that the longer you are homeless, the more you are at risk of experiencing a serious mental illness. So it's not just the case that everyone's becoming homeless because of this, we see high rates of becoming mentally ill um, or having those conditions worsen because someone is unhoused and living on the street. This next point is really just a common sense one, but poverty is by far the most important risk factor for homelessness. If you look at the population of people in LA who are suffering from substance use disorder and addiction or suffering from serious mental illness, very small um, portion of those people are going to become homeless. It is really the interaction of extreme poverty and these conditions that put you at risk of homelessness. Um, and then finally, homelessness is really an issue of racial justice. We see the Black population in LA, the general population, it's about 9% Black, um, yet 33% of our homeless population is Black. So why are we so focused on prevention? This is just a basic uh, graph that shows you the increase in the point in time count population between 2011 and, and um, 2019. It's now about 66,000. So there's a clear upward trajectory. The population is getting bigger. And I'm sure you feel that when you drive around you know, Westwood or other parts of the county. If you've been in the area for a long time, you just know um, that the population is getting bigger. And what's interesting is that there's been a massive influx of public spending through Measure H and Triple H and other efforts. So we are getting good at housing many thousands of people each year, yet the population continues to grow. So why is that happening? There's a lot of urgency at the city and the county and now even at the state level to really understand inflows and to test prevention. Can we stop some group of people from becoming homeless before it ever happens and start to reduce the number of people who need things like emergency shelter, um, or subsidized housing units. So this is really what's motivating our research. The big question here is, can we prevent homelessness before it happens? And to answer that big question, we've got to tackle a few related questions, including what are the pathways into homelessness? How are people getting from point A to point B? 
who's the population at highest risk of experiencing this pretty extreme outcome? Um, and then if we do know who's at risk, what are the interventions that are gonna work and for whom? Um, they might look different for different types of people. The overall goal here obviously is to create um, a low cost intervention that we can give to people before they're homeless that keeps them stably housed to avoid all of the personal tragedies and dramatic negative effects that become that come of becoming homeless and also the long-term costs for the county. Well, it's Mark. So, sorry, go ahead. Hello. Oh, I, I don't think that was for me. <laughs> that might be a comment. But obviously, if you can spend a smaller amount of money to keep someone housed, you avoid very expensive investments down the road that might be a shelter bed or even a full um, housing unit. What do we mean by prevention? I, I think it's really important to understand what we mean by that word because it can mean several things. Universal prevention is this idea that we really need to tackle the fabric of our society and the, the systems that are putting people at risk of homelessness. So um, some people call this upstream prevention or universal prevention, but these are strategies to reduce uh, mass incarceration or to increase access to the labor market in certain communities or to tackle housing prices or the affordable housing supply. Um, these are big societal interventions or public health approaches to the problem. They're very important, but they're not what we're talking about here today. What we're talking about today is what we call targeted prevention. It is an intervention um, at a key moment who, um, for a group of people who are at high risk of becoming homeless in, in the near future. And for this to work, it's got to be effective. We actually have to show that whatever that intervention is, it keeps someone stably housed. It needs to be efficient, meaning we have to give it to the right people. Um, you can't give it to everyone and then not see a reduction in homelessness because you're not giving it to people who are actually at risk. And then if you're succeeding at a community level, you'll start to see inflows decrease um, over time. So there is evidence um, out there from other labs in particular and, and some of our work too that prevention does work. It is possible to do this. There was a really interesting study based out of Chicago conducted by Notre Dame that showed that one time small amounts of cash assistance ranging in the $1,500 to $3,000, you give the cash once and you walk away, there's no other services. But that was actually effective at stopping some people from becoming homeless. The real question though is how do you know who to give that cash assistance to? Um, and so that's what we're gonna talk about today. How do we know who is at risk of homelessness? And I wanna um, put some numbers on the math problem here. So we're gonna talk about um, predictive analytics, which feeds off of large administrative data sets. So we're gonna focus on the population of existing county clients. These are people who are in the jail, they're on probation, they're getting substance use treatment, they're in the emergency departments um, seeking treatment, inpatient, outpatient care. There's a lot of people getting food stamps, um, a lot of people getting TANF, which is called CalWORKs um, in California, um, or just general relief, basic payments. So the county has data on basically close to 2 million single adults um, who all appear to be um, at very high risk of homelessness. Sorry, I have a, um, I just need to pause for one second and I'll be right. These are the things that don't happen when you're presenting in person. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we have 2 million single adults and we're trying to figure out who are gonna be the 15,000 people who fall into homelessness for the first time or the 34,000 people um, who are gonna experience a new homeless spell. So this is really a needle in a haystack problem. Um, and I think it's sometimes we focus because the size of the population feels so big to us when we drive around and we see how many people who are living on the street we lose sight of the fact that it's statistically very rare. You have 2 million people living in poverty, only 15,000 of them are gonna be homeless for the first time in any given year. So this is where we think that um, advances in data science can be particularly helpful in narrowing down our understanding of who, this, um, who is in this population. 
So this is just a, a graphical representation of what I showed you um, on the last slide. This white box is um, all of the county clients who don't become homeless, 1.87 or 1.9 million people. We have about 75,000 homeless individuals in this data set. That's gonna include a lot of chronically homeless people who are not prevention clients. And what we're trying to do is predict who's gonna fall into this yellow and light blue circle. So about 33,000 people will experience a new homeless spell. Those are people who are returning to homeless services or people experiencing a first time homeless spell. And we're also trying to predict these people who are gonna be homeless for the first time. So how does prediction work? We take five years worth of anonymous client service data from the county um, provided by, now we have about eight different departments feeding into the data set. And we create client histories, longitudinal client histories, um, looking back five years. So what we're really trying to figure out is, is there a pattern of mental health services, jail, time, probation involvement, substance use treatment, um, that's predictive of who is going to become homeless. The models, the algorithms analyze all of this data. There are millions of data points here that interact with each other. And then the model will generate a prediction. So we are predicting who will become homeless in 2017. We use a prior year because we know the outcome. So we're going to measure the precision of the model by looking at the predicted result and comparing it to the actual result. And then that helps us understand whether the model is producing any information that's useful um, to LA County. So how do we do? Can we predict homelessness? Um, there's a lot of data on this slide. I'll, I'll try to walk you through it. But basically, we um, generated a risk list using the models um, and generated 3,000 names who are the people the model thought were the highest risk of, of experiencing homelessness. And then we compared it to actual outcomes and it looked like 46% of the people on our list actually became homeless that year. So one way to think about this is that we took the math problem of finding roughly 1.7% of people and we improved the precision to roughly half, 50, close to 50% or 46%. If we generate a much bigger list, you're going deeper into the list and so it's gonna be less precise. So looking at roughly 19,000 people, your precision to 35%. We also predicted first time homelessness, which is a smaller group and more rare. So you're, it's always gonna be harder to predict something that is more rare. And in this case, we generated a list of 3000 people we thought were at highest risk of becoming homeless for the first time. And about a third of the people on that list actually became homeless. Um, and so you might be asking if you're not familiar with looking at um, machine learning algorithm precision models, you know, is this good or bad? I, I, I don't know. Um, I can tell you that for predicting something as rare as homelessness, these are pretty good results. And the way that the county thinks about this is that, okay, if I have a list of 3000 people, if I serve everyone on that list, knowing that only half of those people are going to become homeless, what's the risk? you know, what's the cost to me? And for them, the cost benefit is actually quite good because even though they might end up serving people who aren't gonna experience this outcome, everyone on that list is 27 times more likely to be homeless than your average county client. So it just really gives them a lot more confidence that they're giving scarce financial resources to the right people who really need it. Also, when we expand the outcome window to be two years instead of one year, this number jumps from 46% to over 70%. So a lot of these people just didn't become homeless right away, but they're about to become homeless over a longer period of time. So I mentioned that um, for these models to work, we need data. We need to see client histories in order to feed it into um, the predictive model and I want to pause here and acknowledge that not everyone who becomes homeless for the first time in LA County has a service history. And in fact, when we're looking at single adults, about half of single adults who fall into homelessness for the first time have no record in the county whatsoever. The first time they're showing up for anything is to say, I am homeless and I need help right now. And for that population, these predictive models 
are not effective because there's no data on those people. We're not going to see them in advance. Um, I also want to say that our, we've focused some of our research on this group, and they appear to be very different from the people who have service histories and who are about to become homeless. And this is really important for understanding what the policy interventions should be. So in Los Angeles, you can self-identify as being at high risk of homelessness right now. You can walk into a service provider and say, hey, I'm about to become homeless, and they'll screen you into prevention by figuring out whether you're eligible. Are you really going to lose your housing? Do you meet the income requirements? If you are eligible, you'll get one-time cash assistance and, and usually attachment to a lawyer who's going to focus on solving your eviction or what other legal processes are, are currently in place. And I mentioned that this population of people who are raising their hand and walking in the door and saying, I'm at risk, are very different from the people we're finding through our models. And I just want to show you what that actually looks like. So we took eligible prevention clients and we compared them to the people on our risk list. And we just saw whether there was any commonality. And there were all, literally only 23 people who were showing up in both data sets. So these are very different groups of people. Not only are they different people, they have very different needs and, and um, service histories, right? So we see that prevention clients, you know, once we have data on them, we're seeing that they're using emergency room services at much lower rates. They're significantly less likely to be in crisis stabilization through the Department of Mental Health or have serious mental illness. And on the right hand side, you're seeing significantly lower rates of substance use disorder for things like cocaine, meth, and heroin. So what does all of this mean? I'm going to try to tie this up um, and, and talk about what the county is doing with all of this information. So we presented the modeling results to the Board of Supervisors and the head of the Homeless Initiative, and they felt like there was enough evidence to start experimenting with pilots um, to try to prevent homelessness among current county clients. Last year, the board approved a pilot um, funded by Measure H to start what's called the Homelessness Prevention Unit, and it's based in DHS and is partnering with DMH. And what we are doing now in the pilot is generating risk lists that are DHS and DMH clients who we think are currently housed but at high risk of becoming homeless. And the idea is that sometime later this year, they'll start reaching out to clients, assessing their housing status, and then signing them up for prevention services if they qualify for them. It's very experimental. It hasn't been done before. We're learning a lot about the data and how to structure the intervention. Um, we are also considering pilots for families working with DPSS, the Department of Social Services, which runs the CalWORK program. Our goal ultimately is to test whether this type of intervention is effective. Can we actually reduce inflows by trying to go upstream within the county department to find people before they come homeless? So our, our idea is that we would measure whether these people remain housed, whether they show up for things like emergency shelter or other interventions. And then we'd also try to see if these um, interventions are having positive effects on things like incarceration or health outcomes. What about this group of people who aren't county clients who are showing up and self-identifying? Our theory is that uh, these look like different people because they might be experiencing homelessness for, for very different reasons. And when we've interviewed these clients, it's clear that many of them are becoming homeless because they have very few financial resources and are suffering from rapidly developing um, financial shocks. So, their car broke down, they lost a job, maybe there was a birth of another child that they hadn't planned for financially, the death of um, the leaseholder of the home, you know, these things that no one in the family is mentally ill, no one in the family has a substance use problem, but there's just an event that broke the camel's back um, and they're now headed into homelessness. And you can imagine that the intervention for that group would be different than the intervention for a group that's a high utilizer of health and mental health services. Um, the key here for this population is making sure that when they do show up and self-identify, there's a screening tool that's evidence-based. So you can figure out who is actually at risk of, of um, becoming homeless. And in a separate research project, we're working with um, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority to empirically validate a survey that you could give to people who are self-identifying 
as being at high risk of homelessness. So just to conclude a few um, takeaways, prevention works, but it's very hard to target to the right people. We think it is possible to use advances in data science to predict the adults who are at risk of homelessness, as long as you have enough data and are focused on the county service population. These predicted risk lists are very different from people who are self-identifying and showing up um, and enrolled in prevention. And um, a big piece of advice that we've given that the county that both the homeless services sector that's going to catch the self-identifiers and the big agencies have to be engaged in reducing inflows. You can't put this intervention or focus on this policy problem in only one location, which has been something of a debate, I think, among people who lead these efforts on, on the public agency side. So um, it's really important that they think about both strategies at the same time because these two groups are very different from each other. So I'm going to stop there and take questions. Here's our email addresses and our, our website. If you want to take a note, we have a newsletter. Um, you should be you know, more than welcome to sign up um, for our newsletter on our website. And I'm going to stop sharing um, to see if there are questions. So Janie, there is a question in the, in the chat room. Okay. Want, wanting to know if people getting out of prison uh, do they have social security cards, California ID, or driver's license? And would this help them get government services faster if they did have them? You know, I don't know the answer to that specific question of how many people exiting the jail have documentation. Uh, we do see that jail stays interrupt really important public benefits. So someone might be receiving food stamps, for example, they're incarcerated, they leave, they're still eligible for food stamps, but the burdens of reapplying and becoming re-eligible can be very high. So I would assume that if there are people who don't have government ID, that that would be very helpful um, for things like that, but I don't have data on that specific question. Any other questions, Tom? Uh, yes, uh, Janie, I know this one slide where you said the first time was 10% of mental health, but it seems to me just, and I have no basis for this, but it seems to me that drug abuse and mental health are a lot higher percentage of the homeless than any of the other reasons. Is that the case? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that. It really depends on the question that you're asking. So when we look at our unsheltered population, we just produced a paper on this topic last week. Um, so it's very new information and it's not something that I presented today. But we're looking at specifically the unsheltered population, the people that we see driving around and who are enrolled in street outreach services. And a quarter of those people have a history of receiving mental health services and 20% have a clinical diagnosis of serious mental illness. Um, and we don't have data yet on substance use disorder, but there's a large percentage of the people who have been on our streets um, who have serious mental illness. And I think the point I'm trying to make is that when we look at people at the moment they become homeless, that number is lower. So we have to distinguish between whether mental illness is the cause of a person's homelessness versus whether they become mentally ill or more severely mentally ill because they are unsheltered and living on the street. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's a big debate. And maybe, maybe Doug will wanna chime in here. <laughs> <laughs> his, his views. I know the LA Times have been looking at this too. Um, I, I should probably uh, leave it to you. I, I, I think I think we all agree that's a subject that uh, doesn't have very definite answers that we can say, yep, this is it. And just chime in there. Um, I agree with, with, with Doug. And it's interesting, we, CPL has done work on thinking about the unsheltered population. And so there are populations, especially those that have been on the street for a while where their mental health and drug abuse is just much, much higher. And these are the individuals that anybody driving around would see over and over and over again. But there is a sort of a bigger group of hidden homeless that are sort of earlier in the stages of that slide, so to speak, that you would typically not see. But then when you back up and do some of these statistics based on who is being served, the, the, the overall fraction among those tends to be somewhat lower.
you know, I agree with what you just said, because I was going to say that the these chronic homeless must have a higher percentage in these particular source groups or reason groups. What, why is it that those issues cannot be better targeted by our government? Well, I can, you know, I can give you one answer, which is that um, for many, many years, people working on homelessness have struggled with almost a, a near total lack of data. Um, and the, this population is very vulnerable. They tend to be disconnected from the types of services that generate data. It's only been, you know, about 10 years since there was even a data system to capture the homeless population. It's called the Homeless Management Information System or the HMIS. Even now it's not used um, as, as consistently as it should be to track the population. So people like us who do quantitative research for years just didn't work on homelessness because there was no data to analyze. And I think that's really a big explanatory factor in what, in what you're saying. And I, people like Till and myself are really trying to push that forward. How can we improve our ability to observe the problem? Because the things you can measure are the things you work on and the things that you solve. So, you know, and as Doug, I think is, is hinting at, and I would agree with, the data is very imperfect. You know, it has, any data set you look at right now in homelessness has what we call really strong selection bias. It's only observing certain people who happen to be in touch with that system. Um, and the unsheltered population, we don't think is well documented by data. So even someone like Dr. Sharon, who runs the Department of Mental Health for LA County, feels like he does not have reliable data to say, here is the size of the unsheltered population and here is the percentage suffering from men mental illness and here is the, the cost of the solution to that, right? And when you have the public official who most needs to know the answer to that question saying, I can't answer it, you know, we have a real problem with, with the data and evidence supporting decision making. So we're just trying to advance knowledge, you know, one study at a time and really push on the data and try to understand, you know, what it means. Um, but I think that's fundamentally the cause of the problem that you're you're lifting up. You know, I, I, I would add to it uh, to answer Tom's question a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. We've we've criticized uh, Lhasa for sort of downplaying the issue, but there I, I would agree with the former director Peter Lin that there's this huge perception bias because if you're if you're making your inferences by driving by. You, you are seeing a very small percentage of the people who are out there in streets living in tents. And if you actually go to camps and walk them and talk to people, you get a, a, a much uh, broader picture. Um, and, and so the, the people you see walking in the middle of the street, talking to themselves are, are really a very small percentage of the people you would actually see if you walk to camp. Are you telling me then that her 66,000, 70,000 homeless people, uh, there's the ones you see on the street and the tents, especially around Southern California, well, specifically Westwood even, are a small percentage of the total? What, what I'm saying is that you don't, you, you're not seeing most of the people who are living in the tents. They're either in their tents and you don't see them or they're out collecting recyclables or they actually have a job and they're out working on the job. I don't want to ask too many questions, but um, your data seems to be gathered from various organizations, Janie. Um, you know, you listed a multi of, of, of organizations there. How about on the street interviews, as Doug said, are there any um, basis or any data collected from specific interviews with the homeless? There are, um, there are a few ways that that type of data is collected. It's collected annually through what's called a demographic survey during the pick count. Um, it's information collected through in-person surveys over a period of some weeks. And then those survey answers are reweighted depending on um, the pick count demographics. So it gives us very basic information, you know, like I cited the statistic, how many people say they're from California, they answer questions about their mental health or their physical ailments in that survey. Um, there are a lot of questions, you know, around the methodology and how precise it is. It's very hard to get reliable information in those kinds of settings. 
Um, we also do collect some information uh, when someone's enrolled in services, they will frequently answer questions about things like their mental health history or their physical health history that gets rolled up into the type of data that I described today. Um, and then finally, I'll say that there's um, a lot of uh, discussion right now among the research community about how to do better data collection and how to do data collection that will help answer very specific research questions. Like last week, I was on the phone with USC to talk about how you would do surveys um, among people who are living on the street who are that population of serious mental illness, mentally ill people for the purposes of understanding their functionality um, and what type of housing intervention would be appropriate for them. So there's a, a big unanswered question about who can actually move into a permanent supportive housing unit versus who might actually need inpatient treatment. Um, and so there's a lot more work to be done, but it's certainly you know, one of the tools in the toolkit. It's not work that Till and I le lead on. We, we are more on the quantitative uh, side looking at administrative data, but we definitely support other research teams who are more focused on interviews. Ed, you're on mute. Just press your bar. Yeah, I have a question. How does the uh, homelessness intersect, for example, with the lack of affordable housing? For example, uh, if you take a look at the population of LA County, you have roughly 10 million people living in LA County. And of the 10 million living in LA County, approximately 1 million are undocumented. My question is, what impact do all of the people that are undocumented have on taking up affordable housing and creating a homelessness problem? Um, well, I'll start answering that until maybe you would want to chime in. I think um, there is a lot of evidence that lack of affordable housing is the primary driver of homelessness. Um, it's not something that Till and I have looked at empirically, but there, there's just a lot of research out there to support that. And it's also very common sense. There's a basic supply and demand problem where we don't have enough housing. And that puts a lot of pressure on the entire housing system, right? So you have some people who are housed but unstably housed and then the most extreme outcome is people losing their housing altogether um, because they can't afford rent. There, is, there are research papers out there that just look at things like rent burden, how many people are paying more than 50% of their salary or more than 75% of their salary each year on their housing in Los Angeles. Um, so there's no question that that's the main driver and that increasing housing stock, I think not just affordable housing, but housing stock at every price point is probably the ultimate solution to homelessness in the county. Um, I don't personally know uh, the answer to your question around the intersection between that and people who are undocumented um, until I'm wondering if you have anything to add. Am I weird? It's it's a, it's a it's a, an interesting question, and I don't think we have the the answer to it. I would say that it, it's going to be very hard. To, I wouldn't think of this as a as a causal effect of suddenly immigrants coming in and taking away housing and then causing homelessness. Um, and I partly say that because you know labor economists have studied quite a bit the influx of immigration on local housing market. And, and it, it is a very uh, emotional topic for many people on both ends of the political spectrum. But by and large, it, the consensus seems to be that it's very hard to find that immigrants tend to uh, have an effect on the employment outcomes of natives or lead to mobility of natives. So I, I, I frankly would be very surprised if, you know, there's this sort of causal nexus between undocumented immigration and housing availability. Um, from from knowing knowing what I know about some of the economics impacts of immigration. Um, yeah. 
So I'm going to put a stop there unless people want to stay on uh, and talk or ask more questions of Janie and Till, but our, our meeting is actually over at 1.30, so those that need to leave certainly can do so. Um, and uh, are there any more questions? Maybe that's... If, if, uh, if you permit, I have a question for Janie. Sure. So uh, you, you're using uh, older data that you've um, woven together from several sources to make your predictions. Are you then producing some kind of a tool that can be used uh, to, to make predictions on the fly uh, by people in these agencies? And then which agencies, uh, where would those decisions be made? W would there be some kind of collective um, process for uh, DPS, D D D DMH and, and other agencies to, to look at people? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. What I presented today was really based on our published work um, because that's the right thing to do when you're presenting in public. But as you might imagine, now that we're actually in the implementation phase with the county, a lot of this data work is, is changing moment to moment and day to day to respond to the county's needs for developing the intervention. So to answer your first question, we're now working with um, much more current data. We're, we're modeling risk through with data that's basically up to date with the exception of the last three months, I believe. And we are predicting into the future. Um, so we are now, we've developed a model that can run on a data pipeline. So the data gets refreshed, the models continue to update the predictions. So we send risk lists to the county now um, with a data lag of about three months and we're hoping to close that even more um, in the near future. And that's dependent on the county refre refreshing the data. It's not a problem you know, that we can solve. So we generate the risk list and, a, and there are a few things that we've developed over the last few months to make the information relevant. One, because the intervention is sitting at DHS and DMH and they have to find these people, we're conditioning the sample on recent service history with those two agencies. So we're, we're really predicting risk among recent DHS and DMH clients. Um, and we have to solve this problem where our proxy for homelessness in the data is entering the coordinated entry system. And as you know, that's not necessarily the moment in time that someone becomes homeless. They could be on the street for months and then entering the system. And so to guard against the risk that we're just gonna generate lists of people who are already homeless, we're now conditioning the sample on a recent safety net enrollment where someone listed a physical address as their home. So DHS and DMH are getting a list of people we're pretty confident are currently housed that are their clients that the models are saying, okay, these are the people who are most likely to become homeless in 12 months. They get the list and then it's the departments who are really looking their clients up in the data systems. We don't have access to that information. Um, looking at, okay, are they attached to a service provider? What's their mental health history? Where could we find them? What community are they in? In the next phase of the pilot, they will start actually calling people and surveying them about their housing status. So Mark Rogo has a question. I, I have always thought that the homeless issue and the housing issue are very closely aligned and they're both economic issues. Um, and that no matter what a city fathers want to do using rent control and other ways, that they're, um, they're fighting the gods of supply and demand and the gods of supply and demand are gonna win every single time. And so I've, I've wondered about, you know, projecting the, home, the current homeless issue as it relates to housing 10 and 20 years, maybe farther into the future. If we're moving towards a time when a city's um, basic services will include as one of their top ones, will include massive housing shelters just to be able to provide some sort of minimal housing um, at a reasonable level, uh, nothing that you would even consider um, fancy at all, but just minimal housing, just because the population keeps getting larger, the problem keeps getting worse, and we're not manufacturing any more land, and, um, you know, 
Uh, and going up uh, just is an expensive proposition. So going out uh, on land is, it seems to be um, um, one of the few alternatives left that allow us to, to address this housing problem for the homeless in a more, in a constructive way. Are you, have there been any analysis, Janie, that's been done on that or long-term thinking on that? Well, I think this is, you're really hitting the, the nail on the current policy debate, which is, does the system need to invest a lot more money in shelter or what they call interim housing solutions um, in addition to increasing the permanent housing supply? Um, and what are all the creative ways to increase housing units, particularly for this, this population? And this is, this is just my observation, but there are a few places in the country that have what we call a right to shelter. So if you are homeless, you have a right to a shelter bed. New York City is the largest example. And if you talk privately to the people who advocated for right to shelter in New York, they would share with you that they have a lot of misgivings about the end result. Um, and what they see in their family system in particular is a large incentive to stay there. So a family, a shelter for a family who's homeless looks a lot like housing because you have to have the amenities you know, appropriate to care for young children typically. So those families, okay, they're like, okay, this is, this is housing. I can, I can live with this, right? Um, and it creates a disincentive to then exit that environment. And so they basically have families who've been in these shelters for many, many years and they're uncertain now what to do and they have a constitutional right to shelter. California watched all that unfold and I think has had a real um, serious sort of reaction, like we don't want to go there. We don't want to go, you know, towards a future where people aren't permanently housed. Instead, they're sort of stuck in subpar shelter environments, you know, indefinitely. It's my opinion, though, that that reaction has been too conservative in some ways, that it's prevented us from really investing in more interim, in, in more shelter. We just don't have enough shelter in Los Angeles for any population, single adults or, or families. And I think, you know, just as a a humanity, you know, we need to get people off the street and in safer conditions. Um, and I think the tide is shifting a little bit in terms of willingness to advocate for that type of investment. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that I think it was McKinsey actually who did a really fascinating analysis last year of uh, housing development and the land available in the county to do housing development, whether it's publicly owned or privately owned. You know, so I think the kind of thing that you're looking for, um, and I'd be happy to share a, a link to that after the, after the presentation. We don't do housing research at CPL, but it's a really great paper that kind of outlines, okay, what would it take to actually increase the, the overall supply um, of permanent housing in LA? Sorry for the history lesson, it was a long um, one. Just, Janie, okay. just as a quick little comment, one of the things they don't have, especially in LA, is shelters for married couples without children. So you end up maybe with one on the street while someone else is couch surfing or staying with friends. And again, the count is not really accurate. But that's one group that is kind of uh, ignored. Uh, Gordon, you have a question? I was just going to ask, uh, and I don't think you mentioned it. Uh... Uh, about the funding of your uh, of your lab is is it from clients is it uh, how how is your uh, lab funded? Um, we operate almost exclusively on philanthropic donations um, from foundations, and uh, we have very little uh, funding from our public agency partners. Um, and that's a really important aspect of our model to maintain independence and intellectual rigor. There are labs like ours that operate exclusively on government contracts, but we intentionally set up our funding model to be primarily reliant on independent sources. Our homelessness work in particular is funded by the Hilton Foundation, Arnold Ventures, um, the Irvine Foundation, and a, and a few others. Thank you. Well, thank you. It was a wonderful presentation. Uh, the Westwood Village Rotary will be making a donation in the name of the California Policy Lab and both of you to the Westwood Village Library. Uh, and uh, again, thank you. It was a great presentation. Good luck. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.